Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, we'll start in a bit. So I'd like to invite uh, my speakers onto the stage. Mr. Binod Basnit from Educating Nepal and Valerie. Uh, so good morning, everyone. Namaste and Oaya gozaimasu, as they say in Japan. I'm Ashura Tripathi, the chair of Internet Society's Special Interest Group on Internet for Education. And today I'll be moderating and organizing the session on digital education for the future, improving accessibility, capacity, and workforce readiness. The aim of this workshop, this session, is for all, for all of us to move towards a global internet that ensures inclusive and equitable quality education and promotes lifelong learning for all. Uh, so without further ado, uh, let me introduce uh, my speaker, uh, Mr. Binod Basnet. Mr. Binod Basnet is co-founder and director of Educating Nepal and Empowering Asia. He is an MPhil, he's an MPhil graduate from Kathmandu University in Development Studies with his focus on education. Uh, he's a researcher in the field of digital and inclusive education. He was APRIGF Fellow in 2017 and Australian Awards alumni since 2019 upon completion of a course on inclusive education in policies and practices from Queensland University of Technology, Australia. He's also an uh, Australian Awards Impact Ambassador for Nepal upon, <coughs> upon his efforts for digital education post COVID-19 pandemic in Nepal. Uh, he's a member of Internet Society's Accessibility Standing Group and he's fluent in English, Nepali, and Hindi. And he also speaks a little bit of broken Japanese, I guess. Bino san, sukoshi nihongo mo hanashimasu ne. Hi. Next, uh, next talented figure we have here is uh, Ms. Valerie Yega. She's an advocate of High Court of Kenya and an, in an internet governance lawyer and a tech policy analyst. She, works, uh, she currently works as an associate in intellectual property and technology media and telecommunications team at Bowman's Law Firm. She was a youth ambassador at United Nations Internet Governance Forum held in Katowice, Poland. A youth volunteer at uh, IGF in Addis Abeba, Ethiopia, as well as a youth leader for declaration of the future of the internet under the European Union in Czech Republic. She has also been a fellow with Internet Society, ICANN, Afrinic and Kenya School of Internet Governance. She was an ambassador for Digital Grassroots, a youth-led community in charge of building awareness around digital rights in Africa. Valerie, too, is multilingual, and she fluently speaks English and Swahili, and believes in being woman in the area. Uh, she probably watches too many Korean movies, so she has a little bit of Asia in herself as well. So Binod is representing, is from Asia, and uh, Valerie is representing Africa at the moment. And joining us online, we have uh, Umut Pajaro Velquez. They have a BA in Communications and an MA in Cultural Study, and currently works as researcher on issues related to digital rights, ethics, and governance of AI. Uh, he's fo they are focused on finding solutions to biases towards gender, race, and other forms of diversity that are often excluded or marginalized in the constitution of data that feeds these technologies. They are the chair of Gender Standing Group of the Internet Society and the coordinator of Youth Like IGF and Youth IGF Colombia. They also chair the Gender Standing Group of ISOC and they are fluent in English and Spanish. That's why we often use him as a translator and he provides his service, translating services for free. Uh, we also have Shraddak as our online moderator from uh, the same SIG, Internet for Education. So without further ado, I would like to move on to the next slide. So we say that the internet is everyone. In internet society, we believe that the internet is any, every, for everyone. But there are some food for thoughts for you. There are some things, there are some questions that we need to ask ourselves and within our community. Those are like, does everybody have equitable access? We say internet is for everyone. 
but is the access equitable? What is meaningful connectivity and what is digital poverty? These are the things that we need to ask ourselves when we talk about internet and when we talk about uh, education for all and internet for all. So when we talk about uh, digital education, uh, before I move into my slides, the flow of this session, this session would be I uh, briefly set the stage and then move towards our speaker. There are a few questions that we need to address. And uh, our speakers uh, are from diverse reason, from Africa, from Asia, and from Latin America and Caribbean. So uh, we hope to have a diverse voice here. So there are certain challenges when it comes to digital education ecosystem. So what are those challenges? Uh, the first one is uh, language digital divide. A lot of content that are available on the internet are in English language, which might not be the first language of everybody. Uh, actually, it's not the first language of most of the people, and there are, a few pe there are some people in our area who are not that much fluent uh, in English. So that's one of the challenge to quality education. Uh, the next challenge uh, is lack of skills for digital teaching and learning. So post-COVID, uh, everybody, we moved towards uh, digital education, everybody was uh, focused on work from home, online classes, and during online classes, uh, the teachers and administrators did not have ad adequate knowledge and skills for teaching and learning. And the third one is the industrial skill divide. Uh, we're moving towards fourth industrial revolution, uh, that how we say industry 4.0, education 2.0 for industry 4.0. So how do we cater those needs? There still is a lot of divide, among that, and what that is doing is it's uh, furthering the digital divide, and that's not what we want. So moving further, uh, I would like to share the IEEE's essay, Industry Connections Report on Digital Resilience. You can scan the QR code for the full report, but uh, when we see about the challenges, we have, we have four levels of pillars for challenges. One relates to accessibility, that is, that connects to infrastructure, connectivity, and language divide. The second one is on literacy that focuses on digital content and solutions, skills for teachers and learning, and the industrial skill divide. The third comes the assessment. How do we measure the quality of learning? And how do we engage a learner in online space? And the third one is the challenge of uh, security, uh, cyber security, uh, human resilience, building human digital resilience, that's most important. And what are the future implications that we might bring when we are shifting the whole world towards the blended form of education? And again, uh, there are people, there are people who do not have internet connection, so they cannot get education. They, there are people who have internet connection, but they're not very much used to it, so they don't know how to use it. And the third one is those who know how to use internet, those who are very much active in internet are very much prone to cyber risk. And when we talk about education and bringing our young kids into the space, we have to be very careful about those. And yes, the social cultural norms that restrict the role of women and girls in society hinder their access to the use of digital technologies. And as per GSMA's State of Mobile Connectivity uh, Report 2022, worldwide women are 20% less likely than men to use mobile internet. And now when we talk about gender, it's not a binary, it's not zero and one. There are a lot of spectrums and if a woman are 20% less likely, uh, the non-binary gender, they are more prone to it. So with uh, that, uh, I would like to move directly to our first question that we would like to address. Uh, it would be a different session. We would be asking questions, and the speaker would obviously share their experience and set the stage, but we'd also want uh, more interaction coming from the audience here so that uh, together we can learn more and do something for the betterment of society. So with that, I move to my first question. How can governments and organize and ensure equitable access to digital education infrastructure in Asia Pacific? Africa and Latin America and Caribbean region. Uh, so to stay, for first, to set the stage on this question, I would like to move to Binod Basnet 
to share his experience from Asia's perspective. Uh, thank you, Ashwad, uh, for the question. Uh, before I address the question, I'd like to welcome all of you to this session, to all those who are participating here at Kyoto Interna International Conference Center, and those uh, participating online. Thank you all for being here. And I do hope for a very proactive uh, participation and engagement of everybody throughout this session. Uh, coming back to the question, uh, the question actually does not have a rigid answer. Uh, well, the question in itself is very broad and I cannot uh, take much time on elaborating every aspect. I'll try to be as precise as possible. I'll try to sum this up within four points. So, talking about having a resilient digital education for, for each economy, especially for Asia, on my behalf, it will be much more about Nepal because that's uh, where I'm from and that is the context that I'll be bringing in more. So, it won't be just Nepal, it will be representing many least developed countries or developing nations as a whole. So f for the first part, I think it's very important for a nation, for a country, for its governance to have a wide vision and mission. And this also coincides with the researches done by ISOC as well. Until and unless we have a good vision, we cannot bring in good policies for the nation. Especially for Nepal, when we've just moved into a uh, federal system of governance since 2015. Uh, we're quite young with the federal system. We moved in from constitutional monarch and the powers and responsibilities have been dispersed amongst three tiers of government, central, provincial and local. So different aspects, different policies and different duties have been assigned to different tiers of government and we still, we still have to make much more policies and programs, you know, that help each government understand what their roles are. So that is one aspect that we need to think about, and especially after the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, we've understood that we had a huge impact of COVID-19 on education as well, especially for the LDCs. It was a hard time for education. And uh, it's not unsafe to say that Actually, remote education was something that prevented a complete meltdown of education during the lockdown periods of COVID-19. Saying that for Nepal, instead of use of internet for education, use of radio, use of television, were more effective than the internet way of education because we did not imagine this earlier and we're not prepared for it. And th that was the same case for all other developing nations as well. So the policies that were devised before COVID-19 has to be reconsidered and re-evaluated. Similarly, when we had an earthquake on, in 2015, there was disruption in education, but then the government came up with different building codes and different modality of learning. But after COVID, I think we've forgotten a lot about disasters and we're going back to our normal lives, forgetting what we had to change for education. And it's easy because we have the Education 2030 plan, the SDG 4, and what its targets are. It's easier for government to align ourselves with those targets and meet those targets. So the first point for me is a proper vision and mission. The second point is Infrastructural development, of course, without proper infrastructure, we cannot imagine the new way of learning, remote education, hybrid learning, or blended education. All this requires proper infrastructure. Talking about Nepal again, we have around over 35,000 schools in Nepal, 27,000 of them being community schools, 6,000 of them being institutional or private schools, and over 1,000 being religious schools. Maybe the private schools by themselves are quite well off in comparison to the community schools. When we look at the data, we have bare minimum of one third of those uh, uh, community schools that have 
minimum infrastructure for ICT. Now, having infrastructure for ICT is one point, and, adoption it, and adopting it for education and other users is another point. Even having infrastructure may not be enough if we're not using it because they are just medium. And when we look at the inter internet penetration rate, we had a huge target of reaching 90% broadband connectivity by 2021, but post-COVID, we've just reached to around 36%. So without infrastructure and without its implementation, we cannot imagine the new modality of learning for schools and children. My third point will be one of the most important pillars, and that's inclusion. We need inclusion for everyone because anyone can be a person with disability if we are not provided with right infrastructure support or any other forms of support. So we have the target of not leaving anyone behind. So when we design any curriculum or any learning practices, it should be inclusive from the design to its implementation and any other thing that is there beyond. So inclusion for PWD, IDPs, women, marginalized communities, vulnerable communities, and gender and many other, those are the things has to, that has to be considered from the beginning till the end. And the third aspect is, of, of course, it is connected with, again, infrastructure, but it's about content, it's about competence, and it's about skills. We need contents that can be used for digital education, and we need them in the language that are, uh, we need them in different languages that tailor to the local needs of the people. And talking about competence without teachers, students, parents, and everyone having competence for digital literacy, it's very difficult to implement these programs in the schools or communities. And I think I'll come back to this point for the other questions, but I think I sum up my answers within these four points. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Binod. Uh, of course, uh, the policies uh, that we make in Nepal, from my personal experience, are good sometimes, but uh, we also need to be realistic more than idealistic when it comes to educating kids because uh, internet and digital technology are just tools, and uh, without human interaction, uh, the basic education needs for young children cannot be fulfill, fulfilled. And being said that, I think, uh, there's a lot of things that echoes with Africa as well. So, uh, Valerie, to you, how are things in Africa and how do you think that uh, the African government, African Union and organizations are doing and what can they do for equitable access to education? Thank you so much for that question. Um, I think a lot that has been said by Binod is very similar to what happens in Africa as a continent, but also in my country, Kenya, where I come from. So because he's handled it very well, I'll just give you contextual examples of what happens and what, why we're talking about being future ready in terms of education and the skills that you're going to get. Because I think we're coming from an era where education was just given to students. You have to get the information, get the content, and regurgitate the same for, say, exams or um, passing tests. But now we're looking into a future that is very skills-oriented, looking into a reimagined future where we're getting careers that were not there previously. So how can government and organizations come in to ensure that we have um, a future-ready form of education? And one thing I've seen is that it's a lot about policies and legislation, but more the implementation uh, and the practical steps to get us there as opposed to just um, putting the law as it's written, but it cannot be implemented. So I'll give you an example. What we have in Kenya is what we call the Universal Service Fund, and I know it, it cuts across because I'm sure um, Uganda have something similar as well, so it cuts across some of the African countries and globally as well. So what this fund does is that um, a lot of the companies that work around technology or telecommunication then donate into this fund in partnership with government to ensure there's accessibility and access to the internet. And I think over the years, it's been a fund that has been s slow to be taken up because there's, there's been no accountability and monitoring of how the fund is performing. 
Is the money going into the fund? Is the fund being practically implemented across these regions that require internet access? But I think now what we are seeing, especially with our government, with our Ministry of ICT in particular, is that they've put systems in place to ensure that there's accountability and monitoring of this fund to ensure that we get to that goal of internet access, especially in rural areas. And I liked what my co-panelist said earlier about what COVID did. Because if you look at it, I think if we look at life generally as the studies that we do, we may tend to forget our why. If we look at the impact that is made across and over time, then we'll better understand what this impact is. So I'll give you an example. During, during COVID, the people who were staying in the urban areas were able to continue their education because they were connected to the internet. Whereas those who are in the rural areas, because of lack of the internet as well as issues such as power connectivity, they were not able to continue. So that what that meant, especially now with the tagline of leaving no one behind, is that we potentially left a number of students who have a gap that they need to fill in order to get to where the students who are able to continue their education seamlessly um, are now at. And this, this over time creates a situation where you have fo a form of a global south, but one that is heavily imp impacted by education. You already have a literacy gap within the countries that are already suffering from a lot of developmental issues. So this is one of the things that, from a policy perspective and from a legislation perspective, is very important to understand and to monitor what that impact is. Because once you're able to monitor where that impact is and you're able to know where the gap was left, then you're able to make steps towards um, ensuring that that gap is filled. I'll give you another example. Um, I'm also a telecommunications lawyer, so I work in the telecom space. And what we found is a lot of the telecom players back in Kenya, what they're trying to do now is partner with the government to ensure there's low-cost devices that can access to the internet. Because it's one thing to have an access to the internet, but to lack the device that actually helps you connect to the internet and get that skill or that education that you're looking for. Because one thing that's very clear is that internet for education is very important. There's a lot that's happening on the internet in, in terms of education. You've seen your usual um, Google career certificates. You've seen the skills. You've seen all these platforms that are offering education. And just like now that I'm talking about Asia, even like what, um, if you followed the SDG conversation that was happening at UNGA, there was the example of the Khan Academy and what that impact has been like. However, we can't get there if we're not looking at, number one, connectivity, number two, low-cost devices, and then back to the point of becoming digital ready in terms of the future skills, are we also looking at curriculum integration? What digital um, subjects, skills, um, learnings are being put into the, what we'd call the traditional quote-unquote curriculum that's happening? And this is a full multi-stakeholder approach because what you find as well is that even the educators do not have the capacity to offer some of these um, digital skills that we are saying you require them to be future ready for the future that we are going into. I'll give you an example. Um, we've been hearing all these um, stories about plagiarism and how generative AI tools work. And the question is, we are now moving into an era where it's going to be more about critical analysis. Because what you are saying is that we are bringing in artificial intelligence. We are bringing in all these tools which are extremely of positive impact with the right navigation. Are we also equipping ourselves and are we also equipping our governments, our legislators, our policy makers with the right information to ensure that we are building a digital ready future for our education systems where we're now moving from heavily regurgitation of content to more critical analysis and more thinking, allowing students to think and to create in a world that is moving um, so much across thinking and critical analysis. Yeah, so also to my last point, it would be, we are now moving into a space where we are going to require a lot more of digital libraries. Previously, it was about having books, but how can we access the books with the kind of generation that we are bringing in. We want to bring in a situation where there's cross-border collaboration, even when it comes to education, so that we have a situation where skills can be cross, 
exchange, there can be a lot of collaboration across those who've developed a bit more and those who are still um, looking to develop. So I think that's also one of the points that governments as well as organizations should be looking into to ensure that we have um, uh, a digital ready and future for education. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Yeah, uh, though we are from diverse reason, as we are humans, our basic needs are the same. And you know, for education, right to education is one of the basic need now. So is access to internet. So the challenges are same, but obviously we have to have localized context for that. So moving to our uh, next speaker, Umut. Uh, they are online speakers. So can we get uh, him on the screen, please? Hello. So to you, Umut. Hello, how are you? Well, thank you for the question. I'm going to share some key points about the Latin America situation when it comes to digital education. Uh, probably as, as some uh, as my previous uh, speak, as the previous speaker already said, COVID-19 changed the situation here in Latin America when it comes to digital education. Because we realized that actually we create a bigger gap when it comes to rural areas and also to marginalized communities that were living inside of the cities. So to in order to manage that in a better way, uh, some other governments well came up with some kind of solution that I can I find pretty much in common in several governments of Latin America. And I'm based in Colombia for some of the solutions that we're that starting to implement in Colombia are the same solution that are starting to implement in countries like Brazil, Argentina, Dominican Republic, Uruguay, and others for Latin America. So one of the many solutions is access because uh, uh, and, the, and the way the governments are trying to do it is to promote not only that the private sector get to the rural areas, but also creating community networks and I invest in organizations and the people in the rural areas also create their own networks to be connected to the internet. So this is a way that to expand the robot access, not only to the social use of the internet, but also to a school and other education institutional uh, institution, as I say, especially in rural areas and on the disturbed areas in the country. And they try, uh, they create laws, especially in, in most of the country, that trying to promote the partnership between public and private sector, and also some kind of soci soci socialized race to, to promote that some private companies get to source certain rural areas that is hard to reach. Uh, and all the need of as a mechanism as well as community driven internet accessibility, for example, Mexico, Colombia, and Argentina uh, recently developed laws related to community driving internet accessibility, where they have a, a special rate for this kind of connection uh, and giving access when it, the use is mainly to education. Uh, the second one is they trying to get pro, uh, affordable devices and connectivity, uh, governance uh, organizations, and also working in providing affordable devices and connectivity to a student and teacher several, through several uh, governmental uh, programs. Uh, one of the things that Barely already said, we we are also uh, also trying to implement um, ways to monitor how the resources are being used to get those devices because this is, we had that problem uh, that sometimes those resources are not being used we to to get those devices or to get internet to the schools or to the students. So it's not only it's not only to get not only to create programs that is school based distribution and also task breaks and other incentives, but also monitor those programs in order that we can as uh, giving access through internet and access through the different devices uh, to people in especially in rural areas and underserved areas of the country. Another 
Another aspect is that we are working right now a lot is train teacher administration and administrators on digital tools and resources. Uh, because we understand that after the, pan the, the, the pandemic or COVID-19, that most of the teacher wasn't ready to face uh, the digital spaces and how to teach uh, using the different technological resources. So we need, we understand that we need to train on how to use digital tools and resources effectively in the classroom. And uh, we understand that this training should be tailored to a specific needs of the schools or the, and the community because it's not the same thing to teach in a rural area or in the, or to indigenous communities or, or in a, or in a marginalized part of, of a city or in a private school that in the, 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 uh, than in other spaces. And finally, is develop, develop digital literacy programs for students. Right now, some countries are working in change the curricular and pull and create uh, more digital literacy skills because we understand that these skills are needed in the current, in the current technological development. So students uh, can be actually be aware of, the, of how to use not only the tool for good, but also for the daily lives. We, uh, some countries are developing uh, school-based programs and all and others and uh, I'm working on after school programs and also developing online resources so people can get, so students on um, uh, every ages can be can um, can we can build capacity building for students. So pretty much is like the four points that we are working here in Latin America the most. And so we have no other problems, but I think we have we share a lot in common with Asia Pacific and Africa. So I don't want to repeat exactly what my colleagues already said. Uh, thank you, Mata. I think that's a very good start to our session, and we can already find so much commonalities uh, within our diversity as well, which is something that we can celebrate about always. So, okay, so we all agree that equitable access to digital education is needed, but it does come with other implications, uh, future implications as well. So my question next uh, to the panel as well as uh, the audience here is like, what policy measures can be implemented to enhance educators' capacity and address the cybersecurity risk in digital education space across the region? And how can digital education empower youth with the necessary school for skills for evolving labor market? Because we know that the future workforce is gonna be different. Uh, the third industrial revolution is already over. We're into fourth industrial revolution. And uh, the purpose of education would be to create a labor force that matches the requirement, the needs of the future market. Uh, so I would start this time on the reverse order uh, with Umut first. Uh, so what uh, necessary skills are needed for evolving labor market and how can we enhance educators' capacity to do that? Also by making them secured and safe in the cyberspace. To you, Umut, again. Okay. Well, um, I think one of the things that we can actually do is uh, start to provide professional development opportunities, not only for teachers, and also pro develop digital education standards for teachers and, uh, and students. Uh, that means to not only to include in all curriculars, uh, things about cybersecurity and how to protect ourselves online, but also provide to teachers, for example, digital pedagogy, pedagogy about cybersecurity best practice. Um, also, one of the things that, that should do our governance in when it comes to policies um, probably will be invest, invest in cybersecurity infrastructure because um, 
this school uh, this will be especially in the broader school especially the broader school and other educational institution for cyber attack here in Colombia we received a couple weeks yeah a couple weeks ago a massive attack on probably probably the public sector and a lot of university a, a lot of public universities were affected by the, the by E, so this show the importance that implementing the, the implementing uh, the implementing a strong firewalls, intrusion detection system, and another security measure to protect the information inside of schools or educational institutions. And another when it comes to probably empower you with the necessary skills for the development market dynamics. Um, I think that digital education programs should focus on developing transferable skills that can be applied to buy the new jobs. This is skills should include if, if problem solving uh, skills, capacity, uh, critical thinking, communication, and teamwork. That probably those things that we are going to be using more in a line scale and a technological line scale that where AI is present, especially critical thinking, because we're going to rely a lot along that in the future or in the theme of future market labor. Um, also provide opportunities for exploration learning. This means that not only the way we educate our students is both me just in a regular classroom, but also providing we opportunity to gain three hours experience to internship, apprenticeship, and other program. And they will also to I don't know to skill the to skill develop develop skill and knowledge they need to succeed in the in the workforce. And finally, I would say that. But let's see we more experienced person or some employers that actually can teach the necessary skills, what is needed in the actual in the current labor market, but also uh, we also with the future or the current trends when it comes to digital uh, changes that we are living. Yeah. That was it. Uh, thank you, Mata. So uh, Valerie, from Africans' perspective, from Africa's perspective, so what policy measures have been implemented, what lacks and what can be done to enhance educators' capacity, addressing cyber risk, as well as making sure that the knowledge that we're now providing to our future generation caters the need of the future economy and the future market. Thank you so much. I'll definitely give you a Kenyan perspective as well, but also just recognizing that within this conversation that Kenya is quite ahead when it comes to legislation, when it comes to the technology space, which may not be the same case as most African countries. But the first thing is to map out and find out what the gaps are in the education system. Because as we start to talk about educator capacity, we need to understand what are the gaps in the educator capacity to begin with. Number one, we have, we have two forms of workforce. So we have the educators who are much more senior in the profession, and then we have the educators who are coming in who are much more junior, and who may find, quote unquote, more ease in understanding the technological tools. So it's a question of how are we going to put in place an intergenerational co-creation capacity framework where you're not only skilling the newcomers, but you're also reskilling those who are senior in the profession because you do not want a situation where you're saying you want um, to create a future for the education, a feature that we definitely are going to see more of technological tools being in play when it comes to education. And the more senior teachers or educators are not able to interact with these tools. So we're going to see a lot more of an intergenerational co-creation and being able to be okay with a mindset shift of where the future is taking us, as opposed to holding on to the different educator roles that we have seen before. I also like, uh, I liked Umut's point on infrastructure. Again, the situation 
in Kenya and largely in Africa as well, is that the more urban areas have access to this digital infrastructure. Most likely, I'll give you an example of Kenya, you'll find schools within Nairobi are already using the technology, already have computers, are already set up in terms of internet connectivity as well. Whereas in the rural areas, some of the schools, maybe there's only a computer in a rural school, one computer that maybe is used by the teachers to illustrate. So again, it questions the issue of digital infrastructure because it's very hard to understand a technological tool when you don't have um, access to it regularly, using it and um, testing out what can be done in terms of digital skilling as well. So infrastructure is a big one, but we see more and more that governments are putting in resources and funds into creating an opportunity for more infrastructure to come into the country. But I think, again, it goes back to our role as the multi-stakeholder model in terms of what are the internet service providers doing? What are the private sector doing? What are the companies doing who are offering the services? Are the governments actively reaching out to these companies to partner with them to ensure that this digital infrastructure when it comes to what can be done differently to create a future ready um, workforce? Again, the issue of cybersecurity, I like that as well because um, what we've seen, and recently our Office of Data Protection Commissioner um, rolled out a penalty notice with a fine, with one of the uh, greatest fines sent out to a school. And this is because what had happened is that the school had used the picture of the children as a form of advertisement to advertise a new intake for a school. The question um, that lied therein, and I was asking myself when I saw this penalty notice, is that is the school aware of their obligations when it comes to data protection, when it comes to children, especially because children's data is one of the most sensitive data that is cl classified out there. So the question is, the same way we would have privacy by design and by default, are we also putting in measures to ensure that we have cyber security by design and by default? And I think um, Umut had mentioned earlier the issue of firewalls to ensure there's no intrusion. Are our educators aware that these are some of the technological tools that are being used to ensure cybersecurity because I think what you would not like to see is a data breach in a school because that potentially means that there's a lot of children data that can then be exposed and we've seen the whole discussions around trafficking, around what that data can be used for. So that's something also that we need to look into in terms of cybersecurity, not only awareness, but also understanding how some of these tools are used and how they can be presented to educators to then use them as well. The other thing is that um, what resources are also being rolled out for the educator capacity and are we streamlining it in a way that we can have it in the curriculum integration for the educators as well because we're not going to have one or two workshops for educators on what the internet means, what technological tools we are now facing because one thing that is very clear is that artificial intelligence and technology is moving very fast. I think previously we didn't have generative AI, now we have generative AI. And now that we have generative AI, you've seen ChatGPT roll out, you've seen BAD roll out, you've seen Bing roll out. So clearly there's more innovation that's coming through. Then how are we going to ensure that even as we move to skilling and reskilling educators, that all this is kept in mind to ensure that we have a future ready um, workforce as we move forward. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Valerie. Very, very interesting and valid point, uh, especially when you talk about uh, the seniors and junior educators that are coming in the field. Uh, young people are very much adapted to the technology, but uh, the senior professors might not be, uh, which might create some kind of problems. But yeah, intelligence and solidarity, that's why it's very much important in this phase of uh, human development. Also about the future that you said, uh, it's a very, very valid point and uh, it's also about not going to the future, but it's us that we take this society to the future. So the future that we're going to see is what we are doing now. And the cost of cybersecurity has always has been a problem for cybersecurity by design, but yes, uh, if uh, we invest on cybersecurity now, then in the long term it, the cost is very much effective. Uh, that's something that uh, governments in developing countries need to understand. And also about the rural-urban uh, divide that you talked, uh, I, can, I may very much echo with you because uh, when I started my work, uh, the world was going on dual group computer, but when I took a Pentium 2 computer to a village, uh, 
that was very much what attracted us to build up a school. On that note, I'm going to move to Binod before I go to the audience now. Uh, so Binod, what are your views on this topic? Uh, thank you, Ashwan. Uh, I think most part have already been covered by my previous speakers, Umut and Valerie. Uh, but even so, I'll try to answer those questions in two folds. Uh, first, about policies needed for cyber security. I won't go much with the policies as of now because for the least developed countries, I think digital literacy is very important. Uh, we have a digital literacy of around 31% and we desire to reach to 70% in a couple of years as per our digital uh, framework, Nepal 2019. But that's a hard task. Yes, in terms of literacy rate, we're moving, we're, we're moving forward very well. But the li digital literacy part seems to be quite stagnant. And to solve those issues, I think we need to learn from the existing frameworks. Like Umut said, we need to learn from, we need to make our own frameworks tailored to our custom needs. We can take ideas from the digital intelligence framework. We can use the IST, International Society for Teachers Education Framework. And there are various other teachers' competency frameworks. But I think my concern or my idea would be for least developed countries to design a diploma course for producing trainers on digital literacy. And those trainings could be taken by teachers, educators, and administrators as well. And once we can create those trainers, those trainers could be hired by CSOs or other organizations or government bodies as well to take those trainers to different marginalized communities and give them training. And it's quite urgent now. It's because I think over 70% of the households in Nepal already have a smartphone and they're already using social media platforms very intensively. And with no knowledge about cybersecurity, cyber hygiene, this could be disastrous. And my second point uh, would be, uh, for, especially for the teachers, because if teachers are well equipped and well empowered, they can teach the students and students can go back home to empower their parents as well. We need to devise standards and guidelines for digital pedagogy, online learning environment, learning resources, virtual assessment, digital citizenship, and for educational management and information system. We need to have our local standards, but can be, we can get inspired from the ones that are already existing in the Western countries or developed countries. So that's my first fold of my question, of my answer. But before I go, to my second answer, I'd like to start with a small example, small story that I'd like to share. And then I'd like to get some feedback from the audience, and then I'll go back to my answer. In Nepal, uh, I'm also the director of Empowering Asia, which gives uh, skills, to, uh, skills to students that, are, that, are, you know, that prepare them for the future workforce. And I was talking to this one of these uh, students, and he asked me a very serious question that kept me pondering for a while. He said, in, here in Nepal, I've been studying for around 15 to 20 years, 12 years for my college degree, four years for my university, and then I go out to the um, economy, I go back to the job market, I strive for getting a job, I just cannot get one, and the one I get pays me so less. But I just do a course for three months, and uh, it's a job designed by the Japanese government, and I get a certificate, and the Japanese companies are willing to hire me for around $2,000 uh, $2, per month in a specified skilled worker visa. That three months is so little, but they are paying me so much, so much to get a job. And back home in my own country, I study for 18, 19 years, and I barely get $300 per month job. Why is that? He asked me this question. And I had to give it a thought before I answered him. 
But before we go back to this answer again, I'd like to ask two questions to my audience. Uh, one question is for everybody. The first question is, what do, how do you, what do you imagine the future workforce will be like? That's one question for anyone to answer. Second question is especially for people from, if you are from a developing nation or least developed nation, why do you think we have an issue of employment in our countries? If anyone from audience would like to answer one of these questions, I'd like to give the floor to you. Yes, sir, please. Uh, hello, everyone. This is Narayan Timilsina from Nepal. So it's wonderful, wonderful to see Nepalese guys here as a speaker. Uh, regarding your question, uh, you, uh, what I want to uh, enlighten here is uh, basically uh, we have lots of problem in our uh, teaching pedagogy. Basically, when we see that uh, lots of uh, students they pass out from the universities, uh, they are they are unable to find their uh, job placement right uh, right uh, quickly in the in, in the in the startups or other industries so basically what we are missing is the the not only the curriculum but the the way the teacher they they, they provide their uh, skills and 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 their their, their the new technologies uh, in 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 their in their teaching uh, methodology so the, that's why we are debating about providing some uh, what we call it the finishing school concepts in Nepal we have been debating there in Nepal uh, but uh, mean problem what uh, uh, I want to share in this platform and some find some uh, other experiences from African continent or something like that. Uh, basically, when you talk about digital literacy, uh, digital skills, reskilling, you, uh, you re reuse, you re skilling, it's a, it's not a tangible thing. It's an intangible thing, and it takes a lot of time. So, government and everyone does not uh, are willing to invest on these things right away. They are they are, they like some infrastructure uh, investment and something like that. So, it's very challenging. So, what what is your thought and how how we can cope up? with this sort of things? Yeah, that's my question. Would you like to answer the question first? Let's take uh, the answer from one more, and then we'll come back. So hello to all the speakers. I'm Luke. And as a youth, I'd just like to add my opinion to this issue about digital education for the future and pose a question as well, which is AI readiness. So. Currently, as a university student, a lot of my friends are wondering, should I use uh, maybe uh, applications like ChatGPT to help me with my homework? And if I do use it, what are the best practices in place? Because it's easy to say, oh, you should not do this, uh, but you should do that. But I feel that, as you said, there should be a diploma in maybe teaching digital literacy. So my question is, what are the maybe measurable actions that we as youth can take right now to make sure that we're using it ethically and not uh, doing any unethical work like copying or stuff like that. Thank you. Uh, could you. Could you repeat the question? So ba basically, what are the best practices that youth can take right now to implement AI into their education? Yeah. OK, so for the uh, first part, uh, let me finish my, and then Ashwad, you can answer the questions as well. Uh, well, thank you so much for the audience participation and the question you posted. Uh, within my um, uh, uh, within my uh, ideas that I'm going to share from here on, I, I'd like to answer answer the questions that has been posed. And if I'm not sufficient, please Ashwad help me out after that. How many of us have actually heard of Industry 4.0? If you could raise your hand. or fourth industrial revolution. I think, uh, Valerie, I think Africa actually is very ahead in this matter. There are programs being launched to prepare uh, people for the future workforce with, in terms of Industry 4.0. Let me come back to that. Uh, you, know, you know about the industrial revolutions, right? The first industrial revolution being more about, more being governed by mechanical workforce like steam engines and stuff like that. The second industrial revolution was more about electrical, electrical items, televisions, and all other electrical items. The third industrial revolution being governed much by technology, computers, and the internet. And now we're moving towards the fourth industrial revolution. 
and that is going to be governed by, more by, as one of our uh, audience has already spoken, it's going to be governed by artificial intelligence, big, da big data, machine learning, and blockchain technologies and stuff like that, robotics as well. So our, is our uh, economy ready f for those kind of uh, those kind of activities and are we preparing workforce that match those things is a very difficult question that we need to answer in terms of our least developed countries we're still producing it's harsh reality but i think we need to talk about that we're still producing uh, workforce that that cater to the needs of second industrial revolution so we are always behind playing a catch-up game with the developed countries. We are like the rear wheel of the bicycle, which never catches up with the front wheel. So that is one issue, but I think if we talk about this today, and if we go back home and work out for this, I think we can uh, prepare workforce that are ready for the future economy. And that starts, of course, with the school. We need to have a digital curriculum, digital pedagogy, a digital means of assessment system, and prepare, especially the vocational and uh, technical schools have to prepare workforce that we need for the future. And without that, I think we will again get stranded. The situation we're facing now is the same in our nations. That's why we don't get job, because we're not matching the skills that are needed for our economy at the moment. Uh, along with that, I'd just like to leave a small thought for you. Please hear me out here and give it a thought as well. Being unemployed and being unemployable are two different things. And I think the later one is more severe. Thank you. All rightly said, Pinod, and also about the uh, AI and wow, Africa is moving I had, uh, I think, uh, African Union is also looking for an AI center of excellence, something where, you know, all African nations can benefit from that. So, Valerie, uh, what are your thoughts on the questions from the audience? Thank you so much. And yes, yes, just to uh, agree with Binod, Africa actually is moving into a space where we're looking to see how we can use AI to move the continent forward. Again, just as a background, Africa is the continent that has the most number of young people. It is a quite a youthful population. So definitely it's looking into that. And we've also just seen what's happening with the AI labs in Ghana as well. There's a lot of work going around that. There's also a lot of work being spearheaded by the African Union in terms of artificial intelligence, especially in Africa. And I like the question um, that one of the audience talked about in terms of reskilling and skilling and how we can move it from being intangible to tangible. Unfortunately, we cannot skip on time and we cannot skip on resources. However, we do need to put in the time and the resources to ensure that we get us there. I'll give you an example. Um, recently in Kenya, uh, our government has um, launched what we're calling a housing levy tax. So this levy uh, essentially should be able to assist the government to ensure there's affordable housing um, for low, low income earners. And though we are complaining about the tax, we are paying. So you find that you can't skip on time when it comes to skilling and reskilling of the workforce, and you also can't skip on the patience that is required to ensure there's that mindset shift, to ensure that um, our educators are able to get to a point where they're skilled enough to have this educator capacity and see more resources to move into the education sector that streamlines the whole education sector to ensure that this is being done. Because at the end of the day, we are moving into a time where technology is moving very fast. If you're not skilled or reskilled in the technology space in order to provide this value to the, um, to the learners or the student or the workforce, then over time you find yourself being redundant or not relevant to the workforce or to the education that you education um uh, service that you provide yeah i like the question on that luke asked about um the issue of using artificial intelligence and generative ai tools whether that can be used at an education level i'm a tech lawyer so i'm very pro 
technology. I'm very pro-innovation. I'm very pro the use of tools that can be able to have positive impact, but also understanding and recognizing that these tools can also work to the detriment of the learners in terms of we've had a lot of stories about cheating, a lot of plagiarism, but I think now we also need a mindset shift and an educational shift as to how tests are being done as well. Because we're no longer going to look at content because you could easily just put in a question in ChatGPT and it will give you an answer and you could easily go with that answer. But also as educators, we now need a change as to how this will be done because at the end of the day, AI is here with us and it's here to stay and it's here to create even more innovation as the days go by. So then how can we change that to ensure that even as we test learners, you're able to pick out critical analysis from a plain regurgitation of facts. Because the thing is, uh, these tools are also for good in that even if you were to ask AI to assist you to draft an email say, to your boss, you can already see that there's some value being created from that email, but that does not replace the human effect. It does not replace the need for a, a person to apply themselves and to give context to whatever the generative AI tool is going to bring out. So definitely, a lot will be done in terms of critical analysis, especially for best practice when working with generative AI tools, but the truth is they're here to stay, and the best way forward would be to understand how to use them for good, how to use them in line with the ethical and responsible guidelines that are being formed around artificial intelligence, and ensuring there's monitoring, there's transparency and accountability when it comes to developers of artificial intelligence as well. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Valerie. Uh, also about the question for Luke regarding ethics on AI, I think Umut is one of the expert on that. So Umut, your yes. wise words, please. Okay. Uh, well, um, the use of AI in education is something that are really close to me because it's when AI is one of the things that I work most, the most. Um, when it comes to education, I think mostly the youth already know how to use this tool for good because they already know the limits when it comes to the use of this technology for, for example, to complete a different task for the uh, inner education system. The, the problem here is, is they are not fully aware of the ethical implications or the legal implications of using the, these technologies in certain contexts. So we need also to teach that kind of things so they can use it for good and improve and improve their productivity or the, the, the work they have been doing. And also another thing that we should focus here is to exchange some capacities, some more human capacities as critical thinking, because as I said before, that will be essential in this, um, in this context of artificial intelligence, especially in education. We need to understand that the future professionals or the future of the labor force or the youth that is using these technological uh, tools uh, needs to understand how they work, how they can use it for good, and also how they can use it to solve things. Not only use it because they want to get an answer fast or something like that. It's just to use it to build something from it. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, so moving on to the last part of our session. Uh, and uh, if there is anything from audience that you want to add, please do. So if there's anything, please. I think you're ready for some questions, yeah. So hello, my name is Ivy and I'm representing the Chinese YMCA of Hong Kong. And this discussion has been really informative and insightful. And it's mostly talked about how governments can put out policies. So I would like to ask, is there anything as individuals or as youth like myself, what we can do to also help with digital literacy? I would like to take the question. Yes, I accept it. Okay. Uh, as, a, uh, as a person that has been involved in the youth movement inside internal governance, one of the many things that we came to conclusion during the years that 
we shouldn't be afraid to your voice to say what we said, what we wanted to say in terms of what kind of technologies we want to have. Uh, we know that some governments probably are not so open and not so keen to hear the, the judo voices, the judo voices, but we, when we have a space, we should address all the issues that we actually consider that should be addressed inside of those spaces. We have right now here, for example, the internet governance ecosystem that actually open the door, the doors to many people from around the world to say exactly what they wanted to say about the internet they want. Uh, and so that is an opportunity that we shouldn't take for granted and we shouldn't appreciate and talk about exactly what we want. Another aspect that I, I like to recall in this being on your participation and your incident into policy is, is, is uh, try to find those places in your countries because there are place, spaces in your country, even the more closer ones. There are spaces where you can do incidents and you can participate in the construction of the policies that are being developed in your country. And as I say, don't be afraid to share what you your knowledge or what you see, because probably it's important to build those policies. Uh, yes, you. I think uh, that was uh, that was very right, as Umut said. As youth, I also think you are a very valuable part of the country, and uh, you coming here in IGF in itself is already a good start. So you could, as a youth, you could join in into more. Uh, more events, more IGF forums, regional forums, your country-wide forums, and you could do advocacy for your government on those areas which you feel that need to be changed. And you can take the competency you have back to your home, back to your community, and you can also empower and invite more youths to join in. That way, I think we could synergize and have uh, more empowering youths with digital competency and literacy. Thank you. Uh, Valerie, you are the youth ambassador. You've done a lot since you're younger, so please <laughs> enlighten us. Thank you. Yes, that um, question that's very close to my heart. Um, again, I coordinate the Kenya Youth IGF, so I understand your question and where you're coming from. And just like Binod said, I think it's very important that you're in this forum right now. That really shows that you're on the steps to understanding what happens in the inter internet governance ecosystem. But what I'd say is that they, there's a lot of self-education when it comes to this space. So there's a lot of you trying to actively learn how to engage in this space. And I know the Internet Society has excellent courses that it offers online on how you can engage. And I also know that you're able to join the relevant youth organizations that you have. I know here in Asia you have um, you have an organization that covers around the, the Asia region quite well. It's something that um, Jenna's team does. I forget the name, but uh, I'll, I'll get you the name soon after this meeting. But in that organization, you'll find a lot of young people across the Asia region. And I've found that they are very powerful in that there's a lot of digital literacy that happens within that organization. There's a lot of advocacy as well. There's a lot of community building that happens within that organization as well because I've seen, I've been following the organization for quite a number of years and I know they're very forward thinking when it comes to equipping young people with the skills to navigate the internet space and to navigate it effectively. Also just, uh, one thing that has also helped me being in this space, uh, being, having been in this space for about five years now, is understanding the specific challenges and opportunities that you have from your own home country. Because yes, we do have a lot of best practices in place, but what also helps is once you understand your context and you're very clear on what you're trying to achieve and what change stroke impact that you want to achieve as well. So especially here where there are already set organizations, um, my two cents would be to join those organizations and be able to speak to them. I know the team from Asia Pacific the, within this Internet Governance Forum. I've seen the entire team last night. I think the, they can also help you to navigate this as well. I think also Ananda can help you navigate this space. Uh, he's just laughing there, but he's also part of the youth IGF team. So I think he could also be a good start as to how you're able to navigate this space and with the right persistence and keep 
when you keep keeping on with, with this space, you'll be able to see that your understanding of digital literacy and your understanding of internet governance will keep growing over the years. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I think the, the Jenna's team you're talking about is the Net Mission Academy. Yes. yes. So there's this Net Mission Academy. I think it's based in Hong Kong, supported by Dot Asia. So yeah, you can connect to Jenna or Jennifer for that. And if you want, I think you know them. If you don't know, I can help you connect with them as well. So do not hesitate to do that. Uh, uh, I would very much love to speak more and love to hear from you, but uh, we're nearly in the end of time. We just have last 15 minutes. Uh, so uh, before uh, we kind of wrap up, uh, uh, let me also take this opportunity to thank Ananda, who is here uh, helping us uh, take the notes and keep all the things in place so that this discussion and conversation can continue. And also, as he's in Nepal Youth IGF, very active in this space, uh, uh, I hand it over to Ananda to just, you know, just tell what you've noted. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for uh, keeping me here. So, uh, hello everyone. It was a nice, insightful discussion today. And like we are discussing about a very important issue. Uh, and while today we went through uh, different case studies from Asia to Africa to Latin America and like uh, what uh, we have witnessed uh, with the, we talk about Industry 4.0, a uh, massive development in AI, machine learning, and those are the hot topics of the whole IGF itself. But what we have to also understand uh, that is there's a big digital gap. There are still people who are unconnected from the internet who doesn't have access to the internet because of different barriers. It's might, it might be affordability, it might be accessibility. So today we have uh, discussed uh, many things, but uh, in the age of Industry 4.0, the how do we actually blend uh, technology uh, with the education and uh, actually providing uh, this kind of skills to students so that they are ready, industry ready when they are graduating is the most challenging issue of today. And then like uh, we also talked about the reskilling of educators, uh, contextualization of technology in local context, which is very important. But uh, uh, as I think uh, Valeri uh, mentioned about the universal service fund, there are those kind of service funds which are allocated for developing technology. In case of Nepal, there is a rural technology development fund which can be used uh, and which shall be used to actually make internet more affordable, inclusive, and secure. And there is a role of, uh, we talk about multi-stakeholder engagement in IGF, so there is a role of everybody in this process. Government make policies and civil society need to support them with the monitoring and the accountability part. And private sector uh, will be supporting. And then we can actually build the ecosystem which creates um, the students uh, that are ready for the industry, that can land the global job landscape. So, uh, and I think uh, Umut also mentioned about the community networks. So if you guys are not aware about community networks, uh, community networks are actually the networks that are owned and managed by community themselves, uh, where the, there is no connectivity. Uh, uh, people, last mile connectivity cannot reach at some point and people um, accessing various funds they can build their own community network using affordable technologies. I think Africa has so much of example on that. And then like ISOC and APC kind of organization are working hard to actually build a community network across the world. In Nepal there were few, but I think they are not much active these days. But like we have to work on those things so that uh, the people who doesn't have affordable uh, devices or who doesn't have access to internet and not any device that could actually connect to the internet. So for those people, we can create community learning centers where they can go uh, learn these things. And we have also talked about some open courseware 
uh, where content can be accessed uh, uh, online and offline. Uh, Khan Academy is one of such uh, examples, and I think there are many more. Uh, there's a repo built by Rachel. Rachel Foundation is working on open courseware system where you can find uh, trillions of uh, gigs of information which can be used in rural technologies where there is no access to uh, internet. Uh, it is a local server-based uh, content management system. Uh, maybe some community networks has already used that as well. So, uh, tipping up my point, uh, while policies are way behind in case of like uh, developing nations, uh, we have a huge responsibility and Valerie was asking me to share about how youth can contribute on that. So like uh, what I always tell about uh, youth is we are the biggest stakeholder of the internet today. And then with this uh, role comes a bigger responsibility. How do we actually uh, make this internet uh, uh, more inclusive? How do we help people to actually uh, connecting the people that are not connected today. And then how do we create an uh, ecosystem that uh, allows everyone to access the content in the internet? So, and the initiatives like uh, uh, civil society initiatives like Internet Society, um, IGF itself, national IGF, regional IGF, and local IGF should actually work hard so that uh, we can actually eliminate these things. So I'll wrap up my things over here. Uh, thank you so much for being here. I'll give it back to Asiba. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Ananda. So this is the last call for any interaction from the floor, if there's any solutions available, if there's anything. Hi, good morning. I'm Glendale from the Philippines. Um, I would just like to ask some initiatives that you're presently, if any of you are doing right now. Um, for example, in the Philippines, we, are, we have more than 7,000 islands, and most of these islands are, are in remote locations and still doesn't have any internet connection and even utilities. Okay, um, I would just like to ask, um, apart from just what you have said a while ago, any existing initiative or tools that you can recommend that would answer um, those underserved um, um, schools who, who that soon they will still be able to maximize the use or the advantage of AI and other digital technologies and contents. So that's it. Thank okay. you. Anybody would like to take it? And uh, please know that we have a very little limited time now, so uh -huh. please make it short. Uh -huh. I'll try to be as quick as possible. Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, during 2017, uh, we did a pilot project with movable and deployable ICT resource unit. Uh, it was uh, a community. It was a network for the community for places where there were no internet connectivity. This device would create an internal networking system for the whole community, and it would be a community-owned network. And with those network, people could share information through voice calls, through video calls, through message systems, sharing of photos. But we, was, we used it for education, and uh, it was very effective, and we uh, reported that to Entity, which was further reported to ITUD. One of the study groups has published the effectiveness of how uh, community-led network and devices can be effective in places where there are no internet facilities. And taking this one step forward, uh, we are trying to pilot with locally accessible cloud system, LAC system, that I think has been implemented in Philippines as well. Uh, I think you've been using it mostly for disaster but we, wanted to, we want it to be used for education and health sector for marginalized and backward communities of Nepal. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Vinoda. So, uh, talking about, I think uh, Vinodji has covered a lot. So, uh, actually, uh, when it comes to open source repositories, there are many. Like, Rachel is one of the, I think I have found the most, uh, is its, uh, Spelling and then like in Rachel you get the uh, Khan Academy integrated over there and there are 
a lot of like uh, open source learning resources which are updated periodically, which can be downloaded on any computer. You can make a local server and then like broadcast it to the uh, network that can be accessible without internet as well. It is not internet based. And when you have connection, you can update the content. And there is another initiative called Colibri. It is, and Colibri is also integrated in Rachel as well, but Colibri is more actually uh, on like user end. You have a content, you downloaded it, and then you can actually transfer it to another person's phone without internet access. That is the power of Colibri. It's like a, it uh, uses peer-to-peer -peer networking technology. So if I have that uh, uh, repo, I think what content I have here, I can transfer it to another person without internet. And then like uh, that is they are doing. And Colibri is integrated with Rachel as well. And um, inside Rachel, you can find Khan Academy, every content you have ever imagined. And it is updated regularly. So I think if you want more resources, maybe we can discuss or like set up a call and then we can talk about the, I think Valerie knows more about it as well because many community networks share the same principle. Uh, I deployed one back in COVID and I said, well then myself are trying to upgrade that. It is not uh, operational right now, but we are planning to upgrade that. We have we are going through feasibility study and we are looking for funds. So like those kind of technology are there. We can discuss more because of the time limit there's like red sign coming up. So I think we should wrap up, but uh, we can discuss it offline as well. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, so we have last five minutes, uh, as this gentleman has showed me. So I'll give our speakers one minute for their closing remarks, and shorter is better. <laughs> so we'll start with Umut online, Valerie, then Binod before I close. Okay. Well, um, um that will be my closing remark. Will be to remind that digital education and digital literacy are in the are in the develop right now and in constant change right now because technology is constant is constant changing and society is constant in constant change. So we need to aware that can be uh, the future of education is a world that is done day by day, especially in is in spaces in the global south where our societies still need access, still need equipment, and still need infrastructure. That will be all. Thank you, Valerie. Thank you so much. I think for me, my mantra has always been, each one, teach one. That means that just like um, the member of the audience had said earlier, it's up to us to ensure that we carry together into the future this generation of digitally skilled um, learners as well. So what that means is that how can we contribute? Is it through policy making? Is it through building innovative solutions? Is it through putting our voices towards ensuring that we have a future ready digital skilled education system? So for me, it's always paying it forward and rolling out the information that is required by the stakeholders on the ground. Thank you. Uh, so my last words, uh, I'd like to urge uh, the policymakers actually for uh, the Asian countries, especially the South Asian countries. We all had our ICT in Education Master Plan 1, and I think most of the countries have completed that, and we're moving towards the second master plan. But I don't think there's much awareness about ICT in Education Master Plan amongst most of the stakeholders. We don't even know what the master plan is and what we're trying to achieve. So I think post-COVID, uh, we've learned that ICT way of learning is can be more inclusive and accessible if it's implemented correctly. So I think we need to raise, raise more awareness, we need to map our resources, we need to have realistic plans and not just have plans for the sake of having a plan. And I think post-COVID, ICT master plan too will be a very effective tool for us to reach Education 2030 goals. Thank you very much. Uh, so thank you, Binod, uh, Valerie. Ananda and Umut for your insights and sharing your expertise. So when we talk about uh, internet or any technology, it's free from prejudice or harm or anything. Uh, but uh, how we govern it decides what is used. That's why the multi-stakeholder model is very much important. And that being said, uh, I'd like to you know, go back to the human aspect of technology. How do we get a digital a resilience in digital education? There are technical aspects, but yeah, we have to be inclusive from design. We have to accept diversity and practice empathy. We have to share each other's experience. We don't duplicate things, you know. We have to learn from each other. 
and we have to work as a community for the better shared future. So let's think about our children and our their children, children when we make any kind of decision. Thank you so much, everyone. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank uh, my SIG leadership team, Shraddak, Shra Swetha, Samuel, uh, Maxwell, and everybody who's not here, uh, but uh, they have been supporting us for the past two years. So thank you, everybody. and. Uh, Please do join our Internet Society's special interest group on education. There's the QR code. If you can scan it, you can join us through Connect. And let's move towards a global Internet that ensures inclusive, equitable, and quality education, promoting lifelong learning for all. Thank you so much, everyone, for your presence, and also the ones that are online. Swaran, I see you there. So thank you so much for being there online. Thank you, everyone. I close this session. Also, if you have had a good photo, yeah, photo is always good. So those were present till last. If we could just take a photo for our memory, that would be great. But we could do it right outside the hall <laughs> because there might be next session here. <laughs>